So I'm Amy Martin, and uh, I'm a journalist about town. Uh, some people know me as the senior features writer of Green Source DFW, where I crank out stories about wild spaces and environmental issues and write weekly newsletter for people who like that stuff. And uh, I wrote a book, and it's called Wild DFW Explore the Amazing Nature Around Dallas Fort Worth. And it's on Timber Press. And those of you who are into um, native plants and natural yards, you may know Timber Press as a publisher of Doug Allen, who does uh, his famous book is Nature's Best Hope. So um, the book is coming out at the end of August. Next one. Um, I'm here hanging out with Christy Kerlitter, who I mentioned worked me to death today on the Ned and Jeannie Fritz Texas Buckeye Trail. We meet out there on the second Saturday of every month until it gets too hot or too cold. And uh, we wage war on privet, Chinese privet. I'm sorry, I know that it's, you know, international and everything, but it's gotta go, it's just gotta go. So um, a few years ago, I was writing um, a chapter on the uh, Ned and Jeannie Fritz Texas Buckeye Trail. And I noticed that um, the information about Ned and Jeannie online was getting very hard to find. Um, Christy was making handouts for her restoration crew, and she kind of discovered the same thing. And um, Ned, we're, we're at a very important anniversary. Um, March 13th, 50 years ago, in 1973, there was a bond election in the city of Dallas. And there had been this plot, plan, idea that they could turn the Trinity River, the entire river, from Fort Worth to Houston into a barge canal. They were going to straighten it and take out all of its meanders. They were going to line it with concrete. And Dallas, had that gone through, we would have been an industrial town, not the high-tech finance hub that we are now. We would be an industrial town with all the pollution, all the crime, and everything that's associated with ports and stuff. So um, when Ned was trying to find areas that would be destroyed by the canal, he came across this amazing grove of Texas buckeyes, which are like the Ohio buckeyes, but they're a little smaller and more uh, heat tolerant compared to them. Yeah. And, and they make beautiful yellow flowers. And Christy's been leading uh, walks there for the last few weeks, every weekend, for people to go walk a mile <laughs> down these uh, dirt paths to see these beautiful buckeye trees. So um, what's remarkable is that the area that we walked through and we were just, just completely absorbed by its beauty, was slated to have been leveled and dug out for a turning basin for barges. Keep in mind, barges are as big as warehouses. They're several stories tall, they're huge, and the canal would have actually been a half mile wide footprint. Next one. So we did notice that, that information on Ned was getting hard to find. He was most active in the 60s to 80s. And so after a couple of decades, newspapers and magazines tend to take the information down and put it onto microfiche or other areas that are very difficult for the general public to um, find. I, for instance, have to have a database account with the uh, uh, Dallas Public Library for me to access this material. And we decided that uh, his legacy his amazing legacy you'll learn about was slipping away. And uh, we concocted, a, we lost our mind and, uh, and we um, concocted the idea of a biographical website to preserve his legacy. So it's essentially a book, but it's presented as a website. Next one. And that's Ned with the Buckeyes. Yes, so sorry about that. Um, and it's kind of crazy because the only way to finance a website is to um, ask for donations. So we have to crowdfund it. And um, but this chapter that I'm fixing to talk about, uh, the Great Weed War, is going to be one of the chapters in the book talking about Ned's early advocacy. So um, visit our website, um, nedfritz.com, sign up for our newsletter. And it's kind of interesting to watch a book come into being. You know, you can just follow the progress and everything. And this piece of art here is by Ted DeBosier, and he created it for Jeannie Fritz after Ned passed away. And it represents the life of Ned Fritz from being a, 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 a lawyer who took on loan sharks to being one of the most famous birders in Texas, to being a, an amazing environmental advocate, to being more or less retired and hanging out with G. Next one.
um, an overview. This is the sections of the book uh, website. And Ned, in a nutshell, an overview of his life is already up. Um, Origins of Eleven Legend is partly up. The next one that's going to go up is Trinity Canal and Floodway. Um, so hardly a day goes by that anyone in this room hasn't been impacted by Ned. And you're going to learn why. But many of the nature places, many of the creeks that you enjoy, um, even some of the, you know, without Ned, we wouldn't have a Dallas Design District. That also was going to be a turning basin for the Barge Canal. Um, you wouldn't have Trinity Groves. You wouldn't have the Trinity Trestle Trail. A lot of places that are relatively civilized that you wouldn't associate with Ned Fritz wouldn't have come to be. So um, the, uh, but also places uh, statewide, even nationwide, but the Big Thicket, you've heard of the Big Thicket National Preserve. Ned made that happen. Uh, all the wilderness areas in East Texas, that is also Ned. A number of state parks that you enjoy and national parks you enjoy are also because of Ned Fritz. Next. But today we are going to tell you the story of how in the early 70s, a lawyer who became Texas's most noted environmentalist transformed into the nation's best known native plant advocate. It's a story of a man who loved plants, all plants. And it's a story of his parcel of land from which all his other land saving activities sprung and what lands he saved. Next. As the first acquisitions director of the Texas Nature, uh, the, the Nature Conservancy of Texas, he created 17 preserves right off the bat. He and Jeannie went on to found a group that became known as the Texas Land Conservancy. They are up to 150,000 acres that will be preserved in their native state um, for perpetuity. Texas is extremely low on public land. Less than 5% of Texas is public land. Most states have a much higher percentage. So it's up to private land trusts to preserve that land. Um, his organizational acumen and legal uh, strategies is what helped create the big thicket because he had to take on a lot of big timber companies who wanted to level that and put in oil and gas wells and things like that. Uh, he is responsible for creating 36,000 acres of wilderness in the East Texas National Forest. And that's just the short list. Next. It all began with a three acre lot in North Dallas on the bucolic Cochran Chapel Drive Road near Northwest Highway and Midway. So we're talking about kind of in the middle of Preston Hollow, very chee chee. And uh, as a lawyer for the disadvantaged, he took on loan sharks. We're talking mafia types. His life was threatened. It was a very dangerous thing that he did. And he was only in his 20s when he did this. One of the few people who got out of law school and got a job immediately. Um, he was such an ace lawyer at this, at taking on loan sharks, that um, he created, he filed dozens of what are called appellate cases. And it created a body of national law against ursery or charging of ridiculously high interest rates that stands today. That's his compilation uh, that's now in every law library in the country. Um, and he's doing all of this while he's raising four feisty daughters with his wife, Jeannie, who herself was busy being an activist for women's rights with the League of Women Voters. In fact, them together is one of the reasons why women got the right to hold property and hold bank accounts in their own name in 1974. We didn't get that right until 1974, and we have this couple, and uh, Louise Raggio from First Unitarian is the reason why. Next. Ned remembered Cochran Chapel Road as a place where all the kids from um, SMU, where he was in law school, would go down there, and they would have picnics. There was lots of big trees, there was wildflowers, and with his early success as a lawyer, um, he and Jeannie were one of the first to move to Cochrane Chapel. He um, bought a lot. He built a home to suit his own eccentricities. It merged with the landscape, had huge back windows for viewing birds, and the yard was his solace, you know, and he vowed to keep it just like Native Americans kept it. 
And Native Americans really liked camping along Bachman Creek. And there was a set of um, high bluffs that we now call the Guernsey Cliffs, right off of Northwest Highway. And they used to camp right by that and they would scale the cliffs and they would be able to watch for invaders. Next. But there were compromises in any marriage. And Jeannie wanted a yard with short grass because she had four daughters who had nice clothes and she didn't want their clothes to be all messed up with, with, with native plant seeds and stuff like that. Ned's uh, patch of prairie was about 50 by 100 feet and it was next to the road where few of the trees grew. So between it and the house, Jeannie was granted her little patch of lawn and uh, all else was forested. However, Jeannie had to mow it <laughs> because Ned didn't want to have anything to do with that. I, it was it was a bit contentious. It kind of angered her to have to lobby for this little piece of lawn. And so Ned worked up a contract hammering out the details, how much she got, how she had to, you know, maintain it and watch out for his trees and stuff like that and maintenance details. And they had to sign it. They both signed it. Did I mention he was a lawyer? <laughs> Next. Said Jeannie, it was one of the few things that I later really resented. It was 1951 and I was very young. I just went ahead and said, okay, all right, I'll sign it, whatever. Um, I she said, I didn't mind leaving the property in the Bacchus wilderness because that's where the creek was, Bachman Creek. Um, but I did want a traditional yard from the uh, house to the street and he didn't want that. He wanted it all wild. Uh, there were wildflowers that bloomed and Ned loved those wildflowers. Finally, someone in the neighborhood complained to code enforcement people that it was dangerous leaving the vegetation wild. Ned said, I'm not going to comply. I'm going to fight it all the way to the Supreme Court if I have to. Lawyer, remember? Lawyer. Next. Ned wrote in a Dallas Times Herald piece, uh, uh, article, op-ed, uh, I was fortunate enough to find a natural area to live in, and I have been able to maintain it despite attacks by my own city. It hasn't been a fight between me and my neighbors. I never heard a single neighbor who participated in that. I'm not saying that one or two of them wish that my yard looked like theirs, but they did recognize my right to keep my yard as I wanted it, just like they kept their yards as they wanted theirs. They actually like the flowers that bloom in my yard in the spring in various seasons, but don't bloom on their lawns because their lawns are St. John, uh, St. Augustine or Bermuda grass. So this is a letter of support for his, from his, one of his neighbors. Next. By July uh, 1967, Ned's Prairie received its first citation from the city of Dallas and the great weed war had begun. Uh, his opponent, L. F. Walker, a superintendent of weeds, that was his title, a city of Dallas 18-year employee, and he was strictly by the books man, who Ned would learn later knew very little about plants in spite of being superintendent of weeds. He said, the older, the older enforcement inspectors are the hardest to deal with. With the younger ones, I just explained the, the wildflowers, I explained the native plants, how they're feeding the birds, how they're caring for the wildlife, and they don't write me up for anything. They just go. But now we have this old guy who's like just a few years older than Ned, and uh, he tells me my lawn doesn't look like those down the street. He's hounding me. Next. It wasn't like Ned had nothing to do but fight the superintendent of weeds. Ned and Jeannie were in the process of forming Texas Committee on Natural Resources to take on some of the state's biggest environmental fights. And that group is now called Texas Conservation Alliance. And you probably know them best for their lights out campaign, trying to get people to uh, turn the lights off so that the migrating birds don't run into your building. Um, he was also in the midst of finishing up this book here, the Texas Natural Area Survey, which chronicled all the natural areas across the state uh, that he felt was worth saving. This book was used for decades by uh, state agencies, municipal governments, land trusts to determine what they wanted to preserve. 
So there are many of these parks in Dallas and North Texas that you enjoy started out in this survey. And that's how they discovered that maybe we should save Piedmont Ridge. Maybe we should save the Bonton Woods. Um, in 1970, the city tried to channelize uh, Bachman Creek through his backyard. I mean, it went right through the middle of his property. Well, that was not going to happen. And the 1970s was a period where the, the city, eight, various agencies were just crazy for channelizing stuff. You know, they wanted to just undo every river, every creek, and make it into a ditch. So um, uh, he had three acres and the creek went all the way through it. So he formed Save Open Space to fight it. He won. He always won just about. And uh, that area is now called the Bachman Creek Greenbelt, and it's one of the city's most popular walking paths right now. Next. In uh, 1971 and 72, the superintendent of weeds filed complaints in municipal court. They were dismissed by judges for uh, failure to make proper allegations. Mm -hmm. Walker sent some contractors to cut the lawn, but Ned and Jeannie wouldn't let them on the property. So they went away. In April came a, um, and actually, and then Walker sent the fire department to uh, evaluate the yard as a fire hazard. And they looked at it and went, eh, no, no violations here and left. And then came a stern letter from the city. You must cut your lawn within 10 days or face action. So Ned said, sue me. And they went, okay. And that was not their brightest move. Uh, <laughs> by this point, Ned had a reputation as a lawyer that nobody wanted to see in court. He was the kind of lawyer that people, when they showed up for their case and they went, Ned, huh? Okay, let's settle. I would, ra I would rather settle than have to go up in court against this guy. He's so pugnacious. He is so determined. And he's always the best prepared guy in the room. So, um, it, engaging in a fight with Ned was always pretty much a losing game. So, um, but the city was not paying attention to this and Ned demanded a jury trial, which they allowed. Also another mistake. His skill with pers persuading juries to see his point of view was pretty legendary by this point. The date was set July 13th, 1972. Next. The charge. Quote, Mr. Fritz permitted plants to grow to a greater height than 12 inches and in rank profusion, contrary to and in violation of 16, section 19-118 city code of Dallas, Texas, and against the peace and dignity of the state, end quote. Well, wrote Molly Ivins in the Texas Observer, one man's weed is another man's uh, prairie, which is how Ned C. Fritz ended up in a Dallas courtroom charged with growing weeds. Jeannie says, well, as the saying goes, a man who uh, represents himself has a fool for a client. So Ned didn't handle his own case here. Uh, he was a witness in the case and it was... Um, handled by a couple of his former law partners, uh, Doug Barnes and Don Keek. By this point, Ned had stopped being a full-time lawyer and he was focusing almost full-time on activism. So they had taken over his law firm. Next. Well, not representing himself in court freed up his time so that he could raise a lot of media stink and garner support and publicity. And he was extremely good at that. And that publicity got the attention of a guy up in University of North Texas, which is now uh, called um, at North Texas State University, which is now called University of North Texas. And um, his name was Don W. Smith. Well, his PhD, he studied under this guy who was the president of the Weed Science Society. Who knew there was such a thing? And he was the editor of the professional journal weed science. So back then they didn't call them native plants. They just called them all weeds. So said Smith in his letter, one of my learned colleagues, formerly of the University of Wisconsin and the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN is now at the East West Center in Hawaii. He has traveled and studied the weeds of mankind the world over. 
Maybe y'all could work that into your friendship force stuff. Let's go study the weeds wherever we're at. Not just the culture, go study the plants where you're at. Um, and uh, he has compiled a list of the top 10 weeds of the world. One of them is Bermuda grass. Next, a jury panel was formed from 12 homeowners, 10 of them male, some of them owned real estate. All but one were over 40. Um, or six home, anyway. Uh, Ned noted that none of them were interested in environment or nature. They whittled that down to a jury of four men and two black women, four white men and two black women, and the trial was on. Uh, Walker fixated on and defined weeds as broad leafed plants. So we're talking dandelions and stuff like that. Um, he claimed that weeds harbor rats, mice, mosquitoes, rabbit animals, and criminals. No snakes? We're not going to pull the snake card for this? You know? So he cited the pollen produced by the flowers as dangerous, ignoring the fact that they were surrounded by eastern red cedars, which, as we all know, is a far worse allergen. Um, and he showed his lack of knowledge because he listed among the offending plants Texas wild wheat, which made Ned indignant. There is no such plant. It's Virginia wild rye. And um, upon ex cross-examination, Walker admitted that he had been to the Fritz yard 25 times. And well, as a matter of fact, I haven't seen any rats, mice, mosquitoes, rabbit animals, or criminals lurking in the tall grass. Next one. Ned's um, attorneys presented Walker, the weed guy, with numerous definitions of what a weed was defined by Merriam-Webster uh, dictionary. Walker chose the one with the word obnoxious in it. Uh, the city called Walker's assistant um, and a um, Dallas Parks and Recreation horticulturalist to back Walker up. Well, the defense called in the famous Patsy Swank. Who remembers Patsy Swank? She was the arts and culture reporter for Newsroom, which was this famous news show at KERA. And uh, she spoke of the yard's beauty and uh, how it was not obnoxious to her. And she um, noted that it supported birds, butterflies, and wildlife. Next one. So the defense showed a film of his yard made by KERA, and this is it. So there's no sound to it or anything. So, yeah, the, 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 the wildflowers are now. But you can see how neat and maintained all the other yards are. And then you have Ned and Goldenrod. This became a big deal in the, in the trial. That is a little blue stem, which he bragged was as high as a horse's belly. I don't know what that is. I think that's witchcraft. More of it, like Christy said, this would have been full of flowers in the spring. These are his beautiful windows that looked out over his forest in the back. He loved his birds. Imagine being in Highland Park and your sister next to you. <laughs> There's his beautiful windows and his chair. That's his office, basically. He loved his birds. There's his, his bird bath right there. Okay, we got it. Next one. Yes, there we go. So um, Ned was called in to testify and all was lost for the city. It was a prairie when he bought it and he wanted to keep it that way. He even penalized the building contractor who made his house because he teared too much of it up. Um, he educated because that's what Ned did. He educated wherever he went. He explained the laws of ecological succession, how open lands evolved from being dominated by forbs or broad-leafed weeds to being grass dominated. And this is the little blue stem um, a representative of little blue stem that he bragged was high as a horse's belly. Next one. Said Jeannie, Ned put on a slideshow of all the flowers that were growing in the yard. He knew the name of each one. 
You could tell his passion for the flowers. I sat there and listened, and all of a sudden I realized how much he loved his plants. All the past anger left me. It was like an aha experience, and I was never bitter about my little lawn after that. Next one. Ned described each herbaceous plant and what they did for wildlife and humans. Black-eyed Susan, purple coneflower, flea-banged daisy, green milkweed. He described the native trees and the birds they sheltered, green ash, gumboomia, eastern cottonwood, box elder, Hercules club, Osage orange, and a variety of oaks, burr, red, and lime. He waxed poetic about his creek and the larger trees and the animals that, list, that lived there, and he listed them too. Next one. He loved lists, by the way. He listed all of his beloved birds that lived in his yard. The Blue Jay, Northern Cardinal, Carolina Chickadee, Yellowbill Cuckoo, all of these birds. He listed his hawks, Cooper, red-shouldered, rough-legged, uh, red-bellied, uh, um, uh, anyway, red-tailed. Um, he listed his uh, owls, the bard, the great, and the screech owl. These plants and animals, said Ned, make up a tiny remnant of the mid-grass prairie as it existed when the pioneers first came down to Cochrane Chapel. And he pointed out that one of the most historic cemeteries in Dallas is located on Cochrane Chapel behind Cochrane Chapel Methodist Church. Next one. Ned went on to bemoan the Blackland Prairie's fate. Even in the 70s, it was fast diminishing. As the acquisitions director of Nature, Nature Conservancy Texas, his first preserve was a swath of coastal prairie that would later be sold to the federal government and became Atwater Prairie Chicken National Wildlife Refuge. Soon after that, the Conservancy uh, purchased Trident's Prairie near Paris, Texas, and Ned arranged for Mary Sea Prairie prairie located on a high spot in the big thicket to be purchased by Texas Conservation Foundation, and now it's in the hands of Texas Land Conservancy. Next one. Ned's attorneys brought in Gary Morton, a botany instructor at Florida Junior College, who'd done his PhD dissertation on goldenrod. Ned was famous for finding experts that would back up his case. So um, Morton explained um, that a pretty flower doesn't need um, to be blown in the wind. They're, they they're, they're attractive to bees and other pollinators. And so their pollen is carried by insects. So that kind of plant isn't gonna bother your allergies. So flower, the prettier it is, the less it's gonna bother you. So he explained that little piece of science. He um, testified that mosquitoes were much more likely to breed in the well-watered lawn across the street than it was in his little patch prairie, which was pretty darn dry because he would never water it because he was extraordinarily cheap. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, next one. It took mere minutes for the jury to find him not guilty. <laughs> and um, always looking for not just a win, but a policy change, Ned already had prepared in legal, legal language an amendment to the Weed Ordinance of Dallas, which he presented to Walker right there in the courtroom. Must have ticked that guy off so bad. My goodness. Next one. Said Jeannie, Ned was just way ahead of his time. He convinced the city to set his acreage aside for wildflowers at the end of Cochrane Chapel. And it's just a little prairie. And I noticed that when I went down there one year, it was a flame with Indian blanket, a bee balm, and purple thistle. 22 species of, of uh, wildflowers grew in this wild place. Um, any, there's a thing called the law of succession. And that means that you start with forbs and you go to grass, then you start going to brushy plants and then you, you end up in trees. So um, Peter Elm and Privet started encroaching and they had to work with the city to explain the laws of ecological succession and say that, look, if you want this to be a wildflower prairie, you're gonna have to mow it once a year because you don't have buffalo running through that would normally have eaten all the little tiny trees. So you're gonna have to mow it instead. And uh, he brought in, of course, a nature conservancy expert to ex who managed the prairie, uh, Climber Meadow up in Hunt County, to explain this. And she says, and now there's a little sign down there that says Wildflower Prairie. Next one. 
Remember Steve Blow? <laughs> he was a big Ned fan. Um, even 20 years later, Ned was inspiring coverage about his yard. In 1990, the Dallas Morning News um, columnist Steve Blow wrote, about this time every year, I'm sick of, when I'm sick to death of mowing my lawn, I begin to think of Ned Fritz. In fact, I begin to obsess about Ned Fritz. His name comes up as a crazy mantra as I push that infernal lawn floor mower back and forth, up and down, around and around. Ned Fritz, Ned Fritz, Ned Fritz. Why can't I be like Ned Fritz? He's, his is the ultimate low maintenance landscape. So while I push my lawnmower back and forth for the millionth time, I grit my teeth and think of Ned, Ned the Brave, Ned the Non Mower. Next one. Steve uh, asked Ned for a tour of his famous yard. Wrote Steve, Ned gloated a tad as he pointed out that his wife's yard was clearly dried up, a victim of last year's record cold. And that brought us to one of Ned's gripes, plants prejudice. Ned said, settlers came through here and would call certain plants weeds. Native plants were degraded. Steve continued, once he mentioned it, the Vernonia did look rather pretty, kind of tall and delicate. So I began to see that it's a matter of perspective. One man's weed is another man's Vernonia. The column ends with a discussion on the virtues of snags, brush piles, and leaving standing stems for pollinators and, uh, uh, to lay their seeds, uh, eggs in, and leaves for mulch. Steve concluded, because he's a funny guy, and the most important thing of all, you don't feel guilty. You're not napping on the couch. You're saving the planet. <laughs> Next one. Native plants, pollinators, and the ecological costs of lawns Prairie preservation, pollinator importance, leaving the leaves, urban wildlife habitat, and green belts. Standard talking points today. Ned was extolling these things 30 to 50 years ago. And for his vision, the Native Plant Society of Texas bestowed on him the Charles Leonard Weddell Memorial Award in 2000. They caught up. Next one. Just two months before his trial, Ned formed the Citizens Organization for Sound Trinity and threw himself into fighting the Trinity Barge Canal, that thing I mentioned that would have straightened the river all the way from Fort Worth to the Gulf, destroying untold acres of bottomland trees. Uh, business and political opponents, proponents of the canal dismissed Ned as the crazy guy who wouldn't mow his lawn. That proved to be the biggest mistake they'd make. He won that case, by the way, that fight. So we hope, um, I hope to have entertained you with the story of Ned's great weed war. His life is really pretty inspirational. What one mankind, what man, one man can do. And indeed, many of the activists of today draw their inspiration and their playbook on how to win these fights from Ned. Um, we would be ever so grateful if you visited our website, nedfritz.com. And if you feel compelled, give us a little money. And I'm happy to answer any questions, not only about Ned and native plants, but if you're looking for a nice place to walk, even a fancy place in a paved trail, I can tell you where to go. Because like Ned, I know all these places. All righty, thanks. And my, my, my hair is falling down. There we go. Uh, when does your book come out? It comes out on August um, 29th. And um, it's a really neat book. It looks like a little tiny coffee table book. It is full of 350 photos, color, all of them, uh, taken by area naturalists. So they have a very different perspective on things. Uh, the first half of it is um, natural history and ecology and some other really interesting topics like how to manage your backyard for wildlife, what's active at night and how to have fun in the moon. Um, there is a little thing about citizen science where they have these apps where you can go out and identify plants and scientists use those observations to make policy and study things. Um, the middle section is a field guide of native plants and animals. And then the final section, which takes up almost half the book is uh, 25 adventures to uh, places in Dallas, Cullen, Tarrant, and um, Denton counties. 
So it covers everything from really wild trails that uh, I call them go wilds. You need to know where you're going to lovely paved trails. So there's a paved trail called the Texas uh, Forest, Tra the Trinity Forest Trail. Uh, you can get on it right there by uh, the Trinity River Audubon Center. It's a paved trail that will take you directly, deeply into the Great Trinity Forest. So you can experience it without getting any dirt on your shoes. Well, a little dirt. It kind of floats a bit. Um, there is a section on Ray Roberts uh, Lake State Park, which is up um, a little bit northeast of Denton. And um, if you don't feel like walking, you can just drive to that park and drive around all their little park roads and all the little campgrounds, you will see so many deer, so many deer up there. You might even see some wild turkeys and some other big things, but you're guaranteed to see deer. And there's also a driving tour of prairies where you can take this little route, also kind of close by all of that. And you can drive around in the spring, coming up right now, and experience what some of these prairies look, what, what the work, what this, part of North Texas looked like before development. Some of those prairie remnants will let you see Park Hill Prairie, Climber Meadow, um, Paul Matthews Prairie. So this driving route in the book will take you past all of those. So I tried to make it a little bit for everybody, from the people who like to get wild, like Christy, to people who just want to see some nice stuff. Yes? And Mary mentioned that uh, she had just gone on the Blue Bonnet Trail. Mm -hmm. it the Blue Bonnet Trail is going on right now outside of Ennis, Texas, and you can enter into Google Ennis and Blue Bonnet, and they will give you a map, and it tells you where to drive around on these little country back roads and uh, see all of the Blue Bonnets. Also, next win weekend, they are having their big Blue Bonnet Festival. And when Ennis decides to put on a party, it's pretty fun indeed, because they are a polka capital. And so there will be lots of polka bands and lots of dancing. And it's the biggest event that the town has all year long. And so they really put on a show for people. It's very fun to go down to Ennis for the Blue Bonnet Festival and hear the music and see the see the pretty flowers. And yeah, it's it's a big deal. Yeah. Yes, in the back. Well, there's are you there's a couple. I you may be talking about well there's there's several. There's a really interesting group called Trust for the Public Land. And what they do is they'll go in and purchase land and save it and then eventually put it back into the government's hand. Yeah. And so that is a uh, significant parcel of land that is in, I would say, uh, if you know where Fair Park is, it is to the southeast of that. Yeah. And it is on what is called the Trinity Spine Trail, which is a paved trail that that connects to other trails. And this is at an old... Um, it used to be the way that we generated electricity, you needed a cooling pond. And they have since modernized and don't need these cooling ponds. So that park is old um, Dallas Power and Light land that has a lake on it, that, and it used to have an electricity generating plant on it. So Trust for the Public Land grabbed it. The city is now in the process of purchasing it, and it's going to be pretty neat. Um, they um, don't have the dirt trails I'd like them to have, but it's nice that they have preserved this. There's also a Trust for the Public Land um, thing called Five Mile Greenbelt, Five Mile Creek Greenbelt, and it is in uh, South Dallas off of I-45, and that's also a pretty big deal. Um, and then the city of Dallas purchased what's called the Fin and Feather uh, club. They're in the process of purchasing that, and that's a big uh, lake and heavily forested region that is almost to the city of Hutchins, and it's very wild, and eventually that'll be mm, 200 or so acres added to the Great Trinity Forest, so um, some good things are happening. We're not, we're not saving land as fast as Fort Worth, but we are getting out there and, and making sure that there is some parklands preserved. Yeah. Yes, uh, and I'll get you next. Paula and back. Uh, what's this, uh, where they're going to put in the rapids and all that? 
sorry. <laughs> uh, people keep wanting to make the Trinity into something that it's not. And so they go to these um, rivers and the Rocky Mountains and they see the rushing flow and they go, why can't we make the Trinity like that? Well, the Trinity is a prairie river. It's called a drought and deluge river. You know, sometimes it's a little tiny stream and sometimes it's like a mile wide of water coming all the way up to the top of the levees. So um, uh, um, they decided that they would put a whitewater feature on the great, uh, on the Trinity River, right there where and it's called the Trinity Trestle Trail, which is a very popular trail for people. And in fact, right now that area, the Trinity Trestle Trail is just aflame with flowers right now. Black Eyed Susans, I think, is what's blooming right now. It's a great place. Uh, you can actually go to Google Maps and enter in Trailhead and go to any part of the town and you will find a trailhead. So Trinity Trestle Trail, if you know where the old Longhorn used to be, the Longhorn still is. It just reopened last weekend. Yeah, yeah. It's now a concert hall again. They opened with, yeah. Uh, Longhorn Ballroom, and it uh, opened with a sleep at the wheel, um, so it's back, and uh, the um, trailhead for the Trinity Trestle Trail is right there, so um, that is where they wanted to put the the whitewater feature. Uh, Jim Shoots, a journalist, called it the Scout Incinerator, uh, because the first time they put uh, some kayaks through it, the people in the kayaks nearly died. <laughs> And so they uh, shut it down and they determined that they had engineered it wrong and it would cost millions of dollars to engineer it right. They basically ignored the original engineer's instructions and said, oh, we can make it cheaper and, uh, and ended up kind of almost killing a couple of kayakers. And so it cost them a few more million dollars to take that thing out. Uh, the Trinity River, by the way, is the... Um, and Christy was part of this, there is the Trinity River Paddling Trail. And it goes all the way from Lake Louisville, and it goes all the way down to the Great Trinity Forest. It goes all the way to Fort Worth, up the West Fork. It is over 130 miles of paddling trails, and you can go to their website and find out where to put in your canoes and your kayaks and stuff. And it is now a national water trail under the National Park Service. So Dallas actually has national park land right within, kind of land, right within its borders. Yes. Um, yeah. um, thank you for all of this, of which I do hardly any of it. Um, so we, I think a lot of land. So it allows the city to have things, and how does that evolve over the years? Well, one of the things that he did was they had capped weeds at, uh, well, we call them native plants now. Yes, um, uh, but the the now the height for uh, uh, plants in your yard is two feet, not one foot. You know because you can't get a plant up to flowering if if you you know with twelve inches it has to be a little higher than that. So there's a there's a um, a rule that you have to on corners where one street meets another you have to have a visibility of forty five degrees. You know, but um, other than that, you can grow um, in your yard up to two feet high. So my yard, for instance, is very attractive, um, but it is known as the wild yard on the block and I'm entirely in shade and I've got ferns and some other plants that grow uh, almost two feet high. So, and people love coming and visiting my yard and sniffing and watching the butterflies and all that stuff, so. Uh, that? Yes, yeah. Now, you then you get into homeowners associations and homeowners associations will often have their own rules, which tend to be a little bit stricter, but there's people out there learning to landscape with native plants and make homeowners happy. In fact, there's a couple of landscape ar architects in Dallas that specialize just in that. Yeah, so. You know, native plants can be as neat or as messy as you want them to be. Ned's were, quite frankly, it was a really messy yard, <laughs> but um, uh, it was behind a line of trees. Neighbors really didn't see it. So um, my yard looks landscaped, and it's pretty much all native plants. So in, on the map is where Ned's house is. Mm hmm And... Um, Bluffview is named for the Jersey Cliffs, which are where that deep bend is. So um, 
Yeah, and you can see the green belt that he saved, that little green patch of stuff right there. Yep, there it is, Buckman Creek green belt. All the things that you owe to Ned. Ned had the idea back then, decades ago, that creeks should be kept as green belts so that you could have walking paths along them. That is now the thing, you know, is to have a green belt and a place where you can walk among the trees. And Ned was promoting that in the 70s. It only took the city of Dallas 40 years to catch up. I can go on quite a bit about this stuff. <laughs> yes. It's like it's on a mirror, the third museum, and, and Laura Bush and the Wild Rest. Are, 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 you, are you intersecting with those organizations? It seems like it just, there's this patchwork that. Yeah. Um, there, there is an organization called the Native Plant Society of Texas, and there's a native plant society in every state. And they pretty much do the coordinating. So you can go to the Native Plant Society of Texas website, find the chapter near you. That chapter will have a list of plants that grow in your area. And then they'll also give you a list of places where you can buy those plants. The Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center is our holy temple. And, and um, not all states have something like that. It's really remarkable. And we're also looking at about the 50th anniversary of her efforts to put flowers on the, the sides of highways. So we try to be quite coordinated. She mentioned a place called the Herd Sanctuary. The Herd Sanctuary is another great place to hike because the trails are really well maintained, they're wide, they're clean. It costs $5 to get in, but that $5 kind of keeps out people that have bad intentions. You know, you also have to walk through the visitor center to get onto the trail. So they kind of look at you and make sure that you're there and doing good things. And those are really easy trails to walk. Tons of wildflowers, prairies under restoration, forests. They have this uh, wetlands with this amazing boardwalk that goes right through the wetlands. So you can get really up close and you can stand on one of the boardwalks and you can watch this heron rookery on the other side of the wetlands. It's noisy, but it's so funny to watch these big giant great egrets you know, flying back and forth to this rookery. So the, the Herd Museum is really a terrific place in the southern edge of McKinney. And they have a natural history museum, which is a total gas. You won't believe how big that thing is until you get into it. They have crammed a lot of stuff into one place. I think they have a dinosaur. Yeah. Yeah, they have a dinosaur and they have a couple of ancient turtle fossils and they're really a whole lot of fun, a great place to hike. Um, if you've got somebody who likes hiking only dirt places or you've got a woman who wants to go hike someplace alone, I would recommend this place called Leela. We call it Leela. It's, it's Louisville Lake Environmental Learning Area and it uh, has... 12 miles of trails, but you have to pay $5 to get in. You have to go past a gatehouse. And the woman who runs the gatehouse, she'll give you the evil eye, you know. So she she pretty much looks at every guy who comes in and is like, what are you here for? You know, what are you doing? And, you know, so it's a really safe place to, if women are worried about hiking alone, it's a very safe place to hike alone. And there are some short, lovely trails in there. And they also have a boardwalk trail called the Bittern Marsh Trail, where you can really get up close with birds. And the whole pond will go uh, into um, lilies about July. And it's really spectacular to see. Big, big basketball sized flowers and it's spectacular yes are all these places you mentioned in your book yes <laughs> so finding all these in the book yes i think i'm done thank you so very very much I <laughs>